Mr. Ben Daglish passed away on October 1st, 2018, at the age of 52. On that day, the retro gaming world lost one of its greatest and most prolific composers to complications from lung cancer. We dedicate this entire episode to the memory and legacy of Ben Daglish by talking about, but mostly listening to his work from all of his career. I'm Jari Karjalainen. And I'm Bob Engstrand, and you're listening to... Retro Game Talk Show. Retro Game Talk Show. Yeah, I know we're a bit late into doing a tribute, but better late than never, right? Exactly. Uh, today, when we are recording this, it's Wednesday, the 13th of January, 2021. And lots of things have happened since our last episode, which was Random Ramblings, episode 2, mm. released on the 19th of November, 2019. Uh, I suspect that you have some listener feedback, Yari. Uh, indeed I do, sir. Let's start with a comment received through email from Lajlo in October regarding our Ninja Nostalgia episode. It says, uh, Great podcast, guys. Uh, I'm just now listening to episode 5 and I heard the unbelievable story about the original Last Ninja tape that was found on the street. Incredible. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not the one who lost it. I'm not here to claim it. Uh, with a smiley there. I just want to share a similar story or even a bit more crazy. Once I, s I was smoking on my balcony on the 8th floor back in Hungary years and years ago. Regular cigarette of course. <laughs> and I quit since then. So well yeah, I was smoking there with my friend and we had a huge park at the front of the condo. Looking down, something was there in the grass in the far, barely visible. No way, it must be a computer, we said halfway jokingly. But in a second we threw the cigarettes and ran down to check it. Man, it was a Commodore 16, fully functional with 64k RAM expansion. I still have it and love it. Nice, huh? <laughs> I have to say, that's even more random and spectacular than my Last Ninja 2 tape. And that only goes to show some people don't know what they're letting go. It's very nice there. Wow, that's pretty unbelievable. Throwing away a completely working Commodore 16. Mm. Pretty cool. Yeah, yep. great story. Um, we've also had some comments on our YouTube channel's videos. And one of those uh, was from a user called Athletic Design regarding, um, regarding Band in a Box, mm -hmm. which we talked about in our Random Ramblings episode 2. Uh, Athletic Designs wrote, Hey guys, Band in a Box supports real audio track these days. Mm. Oh, yeah. The 2019 edition has been out almost a year, so I guess the 2020 edition is due any day. And remember, he wrote this a while ago. So I guess uh, 2021 edition is due any day now. <laughs> oh, that's possible, yeah. Mm. Uh, I still prefer to use it for MIDI, though. Mm. Great to hear from you again, by the way. Enjoyable retro ramblings, as always. Mm -hmm. mm. Cool. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, it's good to know these traditions die hard. If you'll forgive the figure of speech, uh, we also had a comment from the health and safety department that barbecuing indoors is not a very good idea. <laughs> no, really? it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. No. But in uh, in all seriousness, we take health and safety very seriously, which is uh, one of the reasons why we have locked ourselves indoors more or less for the yeah. uh, duration of the current coronavirus threat. Mm -hmm. and decided to get this episode done now. We at Retro Game Talk Show suggest everyone out there to stay indoors and play lots of retro games, right? Exactly right. So what else has been going on since we left off and all this COVID crap started happening? What has happened? Yeah, I mean, mm. it was back in... It was back in March, about, about, by the way, exactly a year ago, I was actually in Thailand on vacation. That was in January 2020. Oh, yeah. And I remember I was there for two weeks and I remember reading the news about a, there's something going on in China. There's some virus going on and it felt very distant back then. Mm, yeah. But then slowly for every day, there was more and more people infected and there were some deaths and you mm. could sense that there was something going on not only locally in, in Wuhan, but it's definitely spreading. And then uh, when we flew back from Thailand, there was a lot of more people using uh, 
facial masks and um, yeah. using the hand lotions or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Then I came back to Finland, and uh, of course in Scandinavia it hadn't really started yet. Mm. And um, I remember specifically on the 6th of March, I I was invited to um, game audio awards in North Finland in Oulu. Oh yeah. Uh, I performed some of my own music there. I brought my Commodore 64 synthesizer, and it was a very nice, uh, very nicely produced award with a lot of nice. I, I met a lot of nice people and had a, had a great time there. Mm. And then I flew back the next day. And then I was I was supposed to do some gigs, some some live gigs the week after, and from there on everything got cancelled. So from yeah. I'd say the second week of March, second third week of March, all the whole uh, live music scene more or less shut down, yeah. and it's been more or less shut down since then in Finland, where both you and I live. Yeah, pretty much. Mm. I have to say, I, I have been kind of lucky in that way because I have a sort of steady music job that uh, has enabled us here in Rovaniemi to do some minor gigging for 50 people or less kind of venues. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's been pretty good, surprisingly, for us. I mean, just for the. During December, we did like 17 gigs. I guess we were the highest and the most gigging band in the world at that point. <laughs> yeah, that could be, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's been completely utopistic. Mm. Yeah, it's been a weird year in, 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 in every way. I was supposed mm. to do uh, some uh, some live festival shows with my old band, uh, Turisas, back in, in the summer. We were supposed to play in Italy, oh, yeah. France, and I think Spain and Germany. So everything has been cancelled. Uh, the the band that my main band that I'm playing in now from Hertz and Brothers we have uh, been on a sort of a break because we have been working on a new album so we haven't needed to really cancel any gigs so we've been mm. uh, we've been in the studio and working on that album so yeah this, this it's still been a creative year uh, mm. you know people can people can work indoors and people can be creative in 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 other in other ways than to do live shows but of course it's been a big hit mm. it's been a big uh yes for, not only for music uh, culture in general in general live music in general and culture and mm. has been more or less locked down so it's been a sad year in many ways but yeah yeah i think people should start thinking about how to do culture in different ways cuz this whole covid thing has made such an impact that I don't know if we're ever gonna get to the same level in mm. in in ways of doing shows and you know yeah. all that stuff, life things. And of course, of course, uh, globally speaking, Finland has been uh, hit pretty lightly. You know, there is. Uh, mm. I think Finland has less than 500 um, victims of Corona, which is. Uh, very little compared to many countries. Yeah. Of course, Finland. Finland. We there's not so much people in the country. What do we have? 5.5 million, maybe. About yeah. And uh, it's a really big country, so people are living pretty spread out in general here. And and I think when uh, in in March and April, when the government recommended people to live a little bit more in solitude, I think that many people in Finland were like. Um, yeah, what's what's new? There's no difference. People mm. live in the solitude here, pretty much. Yeah, and uh, I think nobody so- goes out anyway. <laughs> yeah, you know, Finns Finns are you know we like yeah. to be be with ourselves and our families, and mm. I think solitude is almost the biggest religion in this country uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> for a long time. So yeah, in a way. Yeah, so that's pretty much sums up the the, the COVID year, I think. Yeah, uh, we haven't had it so bad. I mean, because. As retro gamers, we like to stay indoors anyway and play some old C64 and Spectrum and Amiga and Atari ST or whatever. So yeah, it hasn't been that big of a problem for us. Mm. Uh, have you had any new gaming-related stuff going on? Not new. I've, I've been playing my uh, EverQuest Project 99 uh, on mm. that server uh, for almost five years now. So that's pretty much... Mm been the only game that I've been playing and it's you know it's 20 years old so it's 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 retro enough I would say it's yeah, not it doesn't it go is. far back to 85 but uh, it's it's still retro <laughs> yeah, yeah so yeah no dungeon master <laughs> no I haven't played actually 
I haven't played through Dungeon Master uh, in a year, so I think it could be... Yeah, I also spoke with a Swedish friend a few days ago on Discord. He also mm. plays on the EverQuest server and he sent me a pretty interesting speed run okay. on Half-Life 1. Uh -huh. And I thought that was pretty impressive. Somebody played it through 8 minutes. Played, <laughs> played, played the whole game through in 24 minutes. Oh yeah, I think and I've seen it actually. Uh, it's one of the most crazy things I've, I've ever... Mm, and one of the yeah. one of the best YouTube comments on that video was like, he played the game through um, in 24 minutes. That's how long it took for me to to find this to find the 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 the, the suit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a great one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like 24 okay. minutes. That 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 as long as it took for me to find the crowbar. You know, like <laughs> yeah, crowbar. So it looked pretty amazing. Of course, they're using a lot of bugs and a lot of glitches to to make the player run faster and. Mm, Sometimes yeah. he also, some, and he uses also explosive to, to jump away using mm. guns to fire in the ground and makes him bounce off that. And it's just, yeah. it's just very impressive how much time they've spent to finalize every little second here and there to, to yeah. Uh, yeah. So that that was pretty cool. So I, I just realized that I haven't played through Half Life One and Half Life oh. Two in a few years, and I I have that as a tradition to play those games through. Uh, every two or three years, I just go in and then I play them for a few days, all the way. Mm. And it's very nostalgic because that uh, was one of the sort of first PC games, more or less, that I played a lot back in. Yeah. Uh, that's like twenty years ago now. So, yeah. And you think about, I mean, Half Life Two was pretty much from when the um, S Steam platform came out. So that's mm. that's kind of retro in its own own way. Yeah. That's. Yeah, because I, I must have, be like I have, 20 years ago. Yeah, because I almost. have the Half Life One on mm. uh, DVD, yeah. and then but then I remember I bought uh, I think maybe Half Life Two was maybe one of the first games that I bought on Steam. Mm, yeah. And uh, since then it hasn't really been many physical copy, co copies, uh, physical copies of PC games at least. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've I've actually uh, bought an Atari ST finally. I mean it's been like 20 years on my <laughs> to buy list so mm. i got that uh it's an stfm 520 so it's pretty a basic model actually mm. but it's it's a pretty good one and in good condition and it costs like 150 euros as i recall so that's that's a good thing that happened during this period and mm, that's cool. So you you will have a chance to play Dungeon Master on the actual platform yeah. that it, it's supposed to be played on. Exactly, yeah. So you have to keep us informed uh, for the next episode uh, how your Dungeon Master playthrough has been. <laughs> yeah. Now you got some pressure. Yeah, I got pressure. <laughs> okay, so I think we should get on with the show now. Let's right? get on with the show, yes. Retro Game Talk Show. Retro Game Talk Show. So it's time to move on to our chosen topic in the episode, the life and works of the master chip music composer Ben Daglish, who passed away on the 1st of October 2018. After having belatedly learned of the loss of Anthony Lees and doing a tribute in our Ninja Nostalgia episode, learning of Ben Daglish's sudden departure not long after that came as an even more of a shock to us. Not only because it's another legend from the last Ninja alumni gone, but also because his entire output on all retro gaming platforms is of a magnitude and quality that only a select few can boast of, giving him a rock star like status in the realm of retro gaming. Still, from what we've heard and read, he was known as a nice guy, very dedicated to his craft and still had time enough away from his music and other crafts to be a husband and father to three children. Mm. Daglish was born in London on the 31st of July in 1966, but when he was one year old, the family moved on to Sheffield, where he then spent most of his youth. He went to the same school with Anthony Crowther, another familiar name for Commodore 64 gamers, and according to an interview with Ben at Remix 64, they became friends at around the age of 14 or 15. Tony got interested in programming games for the Commodore 64 early on and got some games published already in 1983. 
And happily for everybody, he dragged Ben in to help him make his game sound better in 1984, with Ben's first two games being Percy the Potty Pigeon for Gremlin Graphics and Loco for Alligator. Perhaps more importantly, the first game to feature a full-length original soundtrack from Ben Daglish was Trap from Alligator 1986. And you can actually hear the theme of the said game in the background. Let's take a closer listen to that, shall we? Yeah. So Bob, I know for a fact that both of us, the last Ninja soundtrack features some of our favorite Ben Daglish compositions of all time. But since we already dedicated an entire episode to that series, let's try to avoid spending too much time on that one this time, okay? Mm -hmm. So 
looking at the catalog we have here of Ben's entire output, uh, what sort of memories do do the game's titles evoke for you? Can you perhaps uh, uh, make an estimation of which are the Ben Daglish games that you played the most? Yeah, I made a little list here of mm. games. Um, I, I think we mentioned this game in our Commodore, one of our Commodore 64 episodes before, but Crackout is mm-hmm. probably the game that I've played most out of um, the games that Daglish has written music to. Yeah, um, it's pretty good. For people who don't know Crackout, it's um, it's kind of a horizontal version of uh, Arkanoid. I think most more people mm. probably know about Arkanoid, right? Yeah, I think it was yeah, the probably the most uh, well-known breakout clone because it came on arcade first, and it's. It's ported to almost every computer and console out there. So mm. the Crackout, Crackout was only available on the 8-bit computers like C64 and ZX Spectrum and uh, I think Amstrad also. But mm. yeah, yeah, Crackout. I, I it was actually a preferred game for me uh, than, mm. for example, Arkanoid. Um, then another game that I had, one of my first uh, original games on tape cassette was Cobra. <laughs> featuring Sylvester Stallone based on the movie yeah, which uh, we heard earlier mm, yeah so that game I played even though um, much uh, long after I realized how horrendous the game was uh, the mm. horrible uh, control and it's it's a pretty hor- horrific game but you don't mm. really know that when you are nine years old and you just have a game <laughs> You, you play that game without questioning its mechanics, right? I mean, you just, yeah. you die all the time, but you're like, hey, there's something I do wrong here. And then, then yeah. 20 years later, you play it and you're like, did I play this? Did I did I suffer through <laughs> this as a nine-year-old? What was I thinking, you know? So yeah, yeah. but, but, the, but the, the, the soundtrack is very iconic and it's very, um, it's very strong. It's all, it almost mm-hmm. saves the game, actually. <laughs> Yeah, and it has Sylvester Stallone on the cover, so what can go wrong? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember loading... That's the nine-year-old. Yeah, I think I uh, probably mentioned this in an early episode, but uh, I sometimes just loaded the game, loaded up Cobra on, on tape cassette just to listen to the music. And I really I really mm. loved the, the loading screen as well. Yeah. What was the, uh, the slogan for the movie was... Uh, Crime is a disease, a disease, and he is the cure. Right? That's the exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, like it. such an eighties slogan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, but um, yeah. So that, and also uh, another game was Trailblazer. Oh yeah. Very smooth. Actually, it's a very smooth and very fast three uh, D scrolling game. You have this. Mm-hmm. What is this? Like a soccer, soccer looking kind of a ball. Soccer ball. Yeah, and that you are sort of just plowing forward and it's, it's a really really actually very smooth smooth scrolling mm. going on yeah um, yeah Trailblazer That's a great one yeah and then uh, there was this uh, skateboard kind of a freestyle skateboard game called 720 Degrees ooh great one yeah and um, yeah and of course uh, Gauntlet 1 and 2 mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. I most likely played the first time on on one of my uh, family vacations in Italy, or uh, in, in those uh, arcade halls. Yeah, jo- uh, jo- what what's it called? Jockey. Yeah, video jockey, <laughs> jo- uh-huh, sal- yeah. sala jockey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, Gauntlet One and Two. Of course, uh, the themes in both those games it's a pretty short. I think it's I think it's only kind kind of a main main like title screen or character select theme right yeah but then again it's a it's an arcade original so you don't expect it to have much of music it's, a, it's just uh, straight into the action and boom you know mm. so it's it's a good thing that these have any music at all oh yeah and it that's that it's in both cases very memorable it's uh, it's very Ben Daglish <laughs> mm. Uh, another game was uh, Auf Wiedersehen Monty. Oh yeah. 
which we will uh, take a listen to a little bit later, I think. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. And uh, another game that I had on uh, original cassette was pub games. <laughs> I don't know why we... Why do we always laugh when we name drop that game? I don't know, it's just... Well, it's not particularly good. <laughs> and and the connection to pub games is somehow Klaus Wunderlich, if anyone knows of Klaus Wunderlich. <laughs> The the main theme in pop games is is a song that we used to listen to quite a lot from Klaus's Klaus's catalog. It's, yeah, can you can you hum the melody? Polka, I think. Oh yeah. No no. No, that's that's a different game. Is that the one? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Anyway. And uh, yeah, pop games. Yeah, uh, yes, not a very good game. But I remember I got the game, and it felt like I got many games in one because they all these events, mm-hmm. like uh, yeah, darts throwing, and dart throwing, some kind of some kind of billiards thing. Yeah, for some reason it reminds me of Tapper, like a little bit of that <laughs> pop, pop feeling. Tapper is yeah. also like you you name drop Tapper, and and uh, we start to laugh, you know, for for mm-hmm. whatever reason. And uh, and of course, last but definitely not least uh the last ninja of course yeah i guess we should listen to some last ninja now that it's been mentioned mm-hmm. here's a track yeah. that we according to the research we've done we have not played this uh theme this legendary theme in our previous episode this is the in-game track to the last ninja uh stage wastelands
such a great track that mm-hmm. one. Also, the last ninja one is very probably my most played Daglish game. So, Bob, since that that's both our most played game with Daglish music, what's the first one you remember playing? Uh, I think that must be Cobra that I mentioned earlier. Uh, oh yeah, um, I'm most played. Well, most played except Last Ninja. You know, I mean, Last Ninja is definitely mm. the most. But I would say Cobra, mm. and then maybe Crackout would be maybe the third most played game that yeah. Daglish has made music for. But um, it's uh, but Daglish, uh, Daglish soundtracks. They are they are very very iconic for my childhood. Because mm. let's see, he wrote mostly games made of made from was eighty five, eighty six, right? That's sort of the peak years. Eighty five to eighty seven, probably. Yeah, and you know, be- between those years, I was nine and eleven. I, I was mm. between nine and eleven, so his tracks they had a huge impact on my childhood. Yeah, yeah. probably everyone who ha- ever had a C sixty four Daglish is uh, part of their life soundtracks. Yeah. But uh, hey, you mentioned Crackout, so. And if I recall correctly, that's probably the first game I've ever played with music by Daglish. It has some crazy upbeat music that I think we should listen to also. Yeah, great idea. Let's take a listen to one of the tracks from Crackout. Crackout was one of almost 50 games published by Gremlin Graphics that Ben Daglish made music for, which must be some sort of a record for any game musician. But of course that's not all. He also wrote music for not only games published by various other companies such as System 3, Alligator and US Gold, but you could also find demos with his otherwise unreleased work. And I'd say after the first few games, the quality is pretty damn high and constant in his work. So to choose the perfect blend of tracks from Ben's epic career for this episode can't be considered easy, right, Bob? No, not e- not easy at all. But I think we've we've played some of his uh, most famous tracks, but um, there are some gems left in Ben's treasure chest, I'd say. Treasure chest, indeed, yeah. Uh, so what do we have next in that treasure chest? Another one of your favorites, perhaps? The next track on my mind is a track that uh, Mr. Daglish actually co-wrote together with another famous uh, game composer, Mr. Rob Hubbard, mm-hmm. released in 1987 by a company that uh, you mentioned earlier, Gremlin Graphics. This is Auf Wiedersehen, Monty.
That was Auf Wiedersehen, Monty, and Sorry for My German, uh, written by Rob Hubbard and the man we are honoring today, Mr. Ben Daglish. Uh, Yari, do you have any specific memories from this game? Not particularly, no, but I do have memories of a review yearbook called Pelit 1987 we had here in Finland which contained pretty much every review that had been published in Finnish computer and gaming magazines up to that point. And if I remember correctly, that was the first game featured in that book. Of course, Monty Mole as a character was very familiar from Spectrum with his first game, Wanted Monty Mole. Oh, yeah. Uh, so what would be the next track in the playlist of Ben Daglish's Great Craft? <clears throat> well... We have been focusing on his C64 material so far, but he did write great stuff for other machines as well, so I think we should take a listen to something out of the C64 realm thing. Mm -hmm. What about, um, well, I've always been partial to his Pac-Mania soundtrack, which was actually one of the first games I ever played on the Commodore Amiga. Does that sound like a good idea? Sure. Um Pac-Mania sounds good to me, even though it isn't a game that I have any certain connection with. Uh, what uh, specific track from the game did you have in mind, if there are many to choose from? I think the first level music is the most recognizable, maybe the second as well. But let's see, let's go with at least the first one and see what happens. <laughs> this is actually the Atari ST version, because I think that sounds better. Mm, okay. Here's Pac-Mania Level 1. Yeah, that track. Uh, yeah, blah 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 blah. <laughs> that track uh, makes me very happy, and I do recognize yeah. it heavily, even though I hardly ever played Pac Mania. Mm. Uh, next up, I have decided to play you uh, a few shorter tracks that Daglish uh, composed. And even though they are a bit short, uh, the game titles are so famous, it would be a shame to leave them out. So I made a okay. little medley out of three games. Ooh, cool. And they are in order of appearance. 720 degrees, Gauntlet 1 and Gauntlet 2. Enjoy.
That's some classic Daglish stuff right there. Yeah. Although it should probably be pointed out that all three from your medley, as well as Pac Mania, are all rearrangements from the arcade soundtracks. And rewriting tracks is something that Daglish was also insanely good at. But we haven't really dug dug into what sort of composer he was. <laughs> no, but, but obviously he was one of the first big ones that came out as a properly credited computer composer computer music composer, along with Rob Hubbard and Martin Galway. Uh, I mean, how would we compare Ben Daglish to his colleagues at the time? Uh, well, I took the time to analyze some of the most famous tracks made by mm. the composers you mentioned, uh, Daglish, uh, Hubbard and Galway. And even though I think of myself as very experienced in the world of music, it's pretty damn difficult to come up with specific differences in their way of uh, composing music. And I think it's because the, the Commodore 64 sound card, the, 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 the SID chip, is so distinctive as a sound source. You could play a, a Rob Hubbard track to any C64 fan and, and convince them that, that it's written by Galway and vice versa, yeah. because the, the usage of uh, fast arpeggios for faking chords, the filters, the pitch bending, etc. Yeah. What what we think might be a composer's, you know, uh, his or her own touch, personal touch, is pretty much linked to the sound that the SID chip, SID chip itself reproduced, uh, mm. compared to... Uh, you know, composers today where every composer has an enormous range of sound libraries and sources to help develop his or her own style. Yeah, that's true. I think it can also be the other way around, if you know what I mean. That new things can be brought out of any machine if you can learn how to, you know, tweak them in ways that no one has before. That's basically what Daglish, Hubbard and Galway did in their time which kind of explains the sounds they were creating from around 1985 to 1991 or so, mm -hmm. with no specific tools even, just hardcore coding. Yeah. And yeah, and what happened before that on the SID chip felt like, you know, it, for, it was from the Stone Ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. But since the, the SID chip has such an instantly recognizable sound, your first thought might not be, your first thought hearing a track might not be, hey, who composed this? But instead, hey, that's a C64, mm. which makes yeah. it uh, difficult to compare composers using that sound source, which is so specific mm. compared to today's standard of music creating tools. But uh, yeah, but if, if we look at other platforms than the uh, Commodore 64, Yari, what have you found out about Daglish, uh, Daglish's work for other platforms at the time, such as Amstrad, Spectrum, Amiga, mm. etc.? Yeah, well, uh, well, you can't really find a more prolific game music composer than Daglish, at least from the 80s. I mean, he did around 80 game soundtracks for the Commodore 64 alone, which beats the second place holder, Rob Hubbard, by, uh, I think it was around 30 less credits than Daglish, which still is pretty damn many. Mm. But for the other platforms, Daglish is practically incomparable with the amount of work he did elsewhere the other game musicians didn't seem to be nearly as interested in uh, what do you call it, a kind of cross-platform composing. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the Spectrum, he has 41 music credits in, in the ZX Spectrum databases, whereas if we take the other two most prolific C64 composers for comparison, uh, Hubbard has only nine and Galway has seven. That's a pretty huge gap there. Mm. And for Amstrad, Daglish did 58 games, uh, Hubbard 20, and Galway only two. Mm. For the, uh, you, let's take a Commodore Amiga, for example, then, from the 16 bits. Daglish is credited for 32 game soundtracks and Hubbard 10. And Galway doesn't seem to have done any music for the Amiga. And there might be some more numbers to dig up from other databases, but I think these already speak for themselves. Yeah, uh, I think they do. Those numbers are definitely not insignificant. And Daglish's massive impact on the 8-bit and 16-bit music scene is difficult to beat. And he was surrounded by some very prolific composers. Yeah. Uh, and as a side note, having gone through the credits of Hubbard and Galway's, uh, it is difficult not to be inspired 
to make some episodes uh, highlighting highlighting the great work they've done for the scene. Yeah, exactly. But since we got to talk about Daglish's work on other platforms, I think this would be a good time to mention that it takes a lot of fiddling to make an 48k spectrum beeper sound musical at all and there are only a few game music composers from that era that were able to make the spectrum sound like something a bit more than a single channel beeper so here's daglish working his magic on the zx spectrum with a theme from hate hostile all terran encounter as an example Cool Spectrum track. Yep. And I doubt that you have to be an audio nerd to hear the difference between the Spectrum and the Commodore 64 sound here. Uh, the Spectrum's limitation in the low end frequencies is very obvious here. It actually reminds me of the high frequency range of the C64 soundtrack for one on one, the basketball <laughs> game. Yeah, true. And uh, I, I guess that's because one on one originated on the Apple II, which also had a single channel speaker to work with by default. Kind of funny that the C64 conversion actually uh, was had a music that was almost a carbon copy of the Apple version in that way. But it's a very personal sound, mm, definitely. Yeah. Uh, since we now seem to have taken a little daring sidestep uh, platform wise, why not take a listen to some Commodore Amiga music Daglish composed? Uh, okay. Next one is from a game called Switchblade. Enjoy. <laughs>
Yeah, that's the main theme from the Amiga version of Switchblade. Pretty cool stuff. Now let's go back to the C64 and listen to something a bit less known from the Ben Daglish Music Library. Here's an odd rhythm track from Alternative World Games, the Pogo Stick event. All right. That was a track from Gremlin Graphics game Alternative World Games, composed by the man we honor in this episode, Ben Daglish. Mm. Up next in our Daglish playlist is a game made by Ariola Soft in 1987. This is the title screen track from Challenge of the GoBots, which has a nice little whiz ball sounding sound effects in it. <laughs>
Right on, that was the main theme from Challenge of the Gobots. Never played one, that one actually, but it sure sounds good. Mm -hmm. But that's Ben Daglish for you. What would you expect anything else? <laughs> now, we still have a couple of really big Daglish hits to play before we end the show, but there's something we haven't done yet, which we have done for almost every episode. And that's the recommendations and disappointments part. But I think we're going to leave out the disappointments this time and just focus on the good stuff. How about it? Yeah, that sounds uh, what good. If, yeah. What if you pick three games with Ben Daglish music that you would recommend and I pick some other three after so we don't end up with the same games? Sure. I've already prepared my top three. Uh, and top three games that Daglish made music for are The Last Ninja, Gauntlet 2 and crack out <laughs> somehow I knew you choose those three mm. and for good reasons it has to be said we have listened to all those soundtracks already in this episode but I think we can fit some more last ninja somewhere here actually we'll that we'll do that one a bit later if you don't mind so I guess if those three games are now out of the question for me I have to go with um, well Teramix would have to be one of them mm -hmm. and Second, this might be a controversial choice for some, but I've always liked Super Scramble Simulator, which is the spiritual successor to the Kickstart games. Mm. Uh, but some people don't seem to like it that much. And the third one has to be Deflector. So let's listen to that one right now. Reflector makes makes me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> what are we? Are you having a snack attack like Garfield? Snack attack, maybe. But um, <laughs> let's see. But uh, now we've come to the end of the show, and I was uh, thinking we could listen to Ben Daglish actually playing some music live. Okay. Uh, I found a video on YouTube recorded in the UK in 2016 where Ben is playing the flute mm. and he's actually a very good player 
Yeah, he is. And this really comes as a fitting ending for the show since it's the first loading theme from The Last Ninja, the Wastelands loader. And it really is one of the definite highlights in Ben's career. Ben's flute playing in this clip is very enchanting and emotional, and I can't come up with a more suitable piece to end the show with. So we just let Mr. Daglish end this episode. I'm Bob Engstrand. And I'm Jari Karjalainen, and you've been listening to Retro Game Talk Show. Please subscribe to our channels and support us on Patreon and Ko-fi. Ciao. Ciao.